Um, well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give this talk. I really uh, also want to thank you for hosting a tremendously interesting workshop. Uh, I learned so much here in the last couple of days, uh, and uh, it's just been fantastic. I can't wait to take some of the new ideas that I got here back to the US, and I look forward to coming the next time. There's a DR2 or DR3. I might even just get an apartment somewhere nearby so that uh, <laughs> I can always be ready. Um, so I'm going to tell you about recent work and a new measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. I'm going to tell you why it's critical for our understanding of the cosmos. And then I'm going to tell you about some very ambitious plans to try to measure the Hubble constant to 1%. Uh, by using, by leveraging uh, what Gaia can do. And uh, if anybody wants to read more about the technical details, certainly of the first part of the talk, uh, we put this paper out, the SHOES team. Stefano Casertano is here as a member of the SHOES team. And uh, uh, you could read uh, more of the details in that paper. So I know maybe you're not all cosmologists, so let me just take a step back for a moment and remind you uh, why it is that we want to measure the expansion of the universe. Our real questions about the universe are of its composition, uh, its age, its origin, its ultimate fate. Uh, but it just so happens that one of the best ways that we can answer those questions is by very carefully measuring how fast the universe is expanding both today and by looking far out, far back into the past. And that is, we seek to measure the expansion history of the universe. Now, we look around the universe and we see that it's homogeneous and isotropic on large scales. That means it looks more or less the same everywhere. Um, and that, combined with Einstein's theory of general relativity, allows us to derive one equation, uh, the equation of motion for the universe, why and how the universe expands. Uh, we describe the expansion of the universe as a change in the square size of this, this square grid that you see. That's the variable A, the scale factor. And that grid changes with time. And so this equation that we can derive, known as the Friedman equation, it's been around for 70, 80 years, tells us how A will change with time, how the universe will expand or contract, depending on terms on the right-hand side of this equation, like how much matter there is, what other kinds of materials are in the universe, what the initial conditions are, what the geometry is. And so if we can go out as astronomers, and use telescopes and measure A of T, the, the history of how A has changed with time. Very much like uh, I tell people, uh, it's like my kids, I want to measure their height uh, on a door frame. So every once in a while, we line them up and we mark their height and a date. And then we mark their height again and another date. And so what we're doing is we are measuring the growth spurts. And in this same way, we are measuring the growth spurts. We can learn things about you know, what humans are made of. and, and uh, what fuels them by measuring these growth spurts. In our case, it's the universe, and we are trying to measure how and why it has changed in its growth by making these kinds of measurements. Now, we cannot directly measure A uh, or directly measure T. So in the observer's world, we measure two other quantities which are very closely related. A, the inverse, is really the redshift. It's the effect that stretches the wavelengths of light. And so that's very easy to see. We look out at distant galaxies, and we measure this stretching, this redshift of light. A little more tricky is to measure t. We want to know what time in the universe the universe had that relative size. We cannot measure time because we have not found clocks, really good clocks, in the universe. But instead, we measure distance. We measure how far away something is. And we know that that distance relates to time by the speed of light. And so by going out and measuring lots of distances and redshifts, we can measure the expansion rate of the universe both today and in the past. Now, I said that we really want to measure this function A of t. But many decades ago, when we thought the universe was simpler, uh, that it was just a universe filled with matter, what cosmologists call a matter-dominated universe, then it would have sufficed to only measure the first two derivatives of A, the first two changes to A, what's called A dot. Uh, and that corresponds to a famous parameter called Hubble's constant. When Hubble determined, uh, and Lemaitre and others, that the universe was expanding, they dubbed, or others dubbed the expansion rate, the slope of that line that I showed you, Hubble's constant. Um, and it tells you 
the age scale and the size scale for the universe. Um, if Hubble's constant is a very small number, it means we live in a very big universe, which is now at this point slowly expanding. Uh, it could be 20 billion years old. This is uh, as we understood this decades ago. Or it could have been that we lived in a universe that was small, only 10 billion years old. This is uh, the state of the art circa around 1980. Uh, likewise, the other of the two numbers that we thought we had to measure to understand the universe was the next derivative of A. That is, what is the deceleration rate of the expansion? How is the expansion rate changing over time? If there's enough matter in the universe, then the attractive gravity from all that matter will act to slow the expansion, which began after the Big Bang. If it's slowed enough, eventually the universe will start contracting and, and in a big crunch, the opposite of the Big Bang. So that's shown here. Uh, in a universe like this, we would expect to see the universe decelerating very strongly. Um, Likewise, it could have been the case that uh, there's very little matter in the universe, so although there is a slowing of the expansion, it's not enough. The universe would expand forever. This is uh, very analogous to when you launch a rocket from the Earth, and you ask the question, did you launch it with escape velocity? Well, it depends on what the mass of the Earth is, and it depends on the velocity that you uh, measure, uh, that you launch it with. So in a case like this, yes, you have launched it with escape velocity. Uh, the universe will keep expanding forever. In a case like this, you have not launched it with escape velocity. Or maybe the Earth is too massive, and so it will fall back. Um, and so that was our question. If we could go out and measure how much the universe was decelerating, we could answer this. Now, these questions in this form uh, had been around for decades. But what really changed occurred in the 1990s. Uh, when we began to build very powerful measures of the expansion rate of the universe and its history using exploding stars called supernovae. So let me tell you a little bit about the tools uh, that we uh, use to make these kinds of measurements. We use objects that we call standard candles or standardized candles because they're very luminous and we have a good idea of what their luminosity is so that we can use their brightness to determine their distance. So one of the most famous ones we use now and began using in the 1990, uh, 1990s were the type 1a supernovae. With these we believe are uh, white dwarf stars, the centers of old stars that uh, probably live with a companion star and material is transferred over to the white dwarf star and there's a certain critical mass known as the Chandrasekhar limit. Uh, and we believe that that star approaches that critical mass and explodes at that critical mass, giving us a thermonuclear bomb that is very uniform, can be seen halfway or two thirds of the way across the universe, reaches a peak brightness that's a billion times the luminosity of the sun. So that's a very powerful uh, lighthouse to be able to measure distances. Now, I just want to mention uh, a fainter version, but still quite powerful, uh, is a class of pulsating stars called Cepheids. These stars do not explode, they just pulsate. But the frequency at which they pulsate indicates to us what their luminosity is, although they are about 10,000 times fainter than the type 1a supernovae. As you'll see later in the story, we need to make use of both of these. Now, um, I call these standardized candles because we do have to measure things like the frequency at which these stars pulsate, or in the case of the type 1a supernovae, uh, the time scale on which the explosion uh, unfolds. That allows us to figure out whether it was a slightly more or less luminous explosion. Another complication is that we see these stars or the supernovae through galaxies, and galaxies have dust and that dims the light, could fool you into thinking that the object is further away than it really is. However, most of the light we're familiar with in galaxies uh, blocks more blue light than red light, and so it also produces a reddening of the light that we can measure and use to remove this effect. So this capability really came to the fore, as I said, in the 1990s. So probably uh, the most famous group uh, or the first group, really, was the uh, Chilean Kalantololo survey. Uh, shown here in green is the Hubble diagram, the, the actual empirical measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. This is redshift on this axis. And on this axis is the brightness of the supernova. There's an arbitrary constant here, because if you want to know the true distance, you're going to have to find that constant. That is, to really measure the true expansion rate, not just a relative expansion, uh, we'll have to do some more work. And we'll get there. Um, in my thesis, 
Around the same time, I also uh, made a number of measurements of these supernovae, such that by the mid to late 1990s, we had a pretty good idea of how fast the universe was expanding around us nearby, that is, today. Uh, and that these individual supernovae could provide distance measurements to a precision of about 6% for each one. This established that space was really expanding linearly. But as I said, the tricky part was to measure the Hubble constant, that is to convert this from a relative distance to a true absolute distance, would require having one of these supernovae, uh, let's say, blow up in the Milky Way galaxy where Gaia could measure its parallax. That's what we needed. And that's a very unlikely event. There's a supernova in a galaxy like ours about once every 100 years. So hopefully you can get Gaia going for a long time because we're, we're going we're gonna to need to wait for that. No, there, there's got to be a better way, and I'm going to get to that. Um, so just to emphasize this, we can measure the relative distance of supernovae even without the ability to measure parallax and calibrate their true luminosity and true distance. Or as I say to the physicists who get a little nervous around uh, the word magnitude, it's very simple. Five magnitudes is a factor of 100 in brightness or a factor of 10 in distance. Okay. So by the late 1990s, two teams, uh, one led by Saul Perlmutter at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab and the other, uh, our team, the High Z Supernova team, uh, led by Brian Schmidt, uh, set out to find type 1a supernovae at much greater redshifts, at redshifts out at about 0.5. So here is the data from the two teams. And if you look at, if you subtract off a low mass universe, that was the one that had just a little mass, it was on the right and would expand forever, we saw that the supernovae were significantly fainter or more distant than you would have expected. In fact, uh, this showed that the universe was not decelerating a little bit, that's what would happen if it fell along this line, or decelerating a large amount, this was the other model that I showed you, the data was going the other way, uh, implying that the universe was actually accelerating. So this was a very exciting result, and it implied the existence of this mysterious stuff called dark energy, which I'll say more about in a few minutes. Over the next, oh, yes, um, one concern we had at the time was, what if these supernovae are fainter for some other reason, not because uh, of distance, but actually because there was another kind of what people called gray dust, a kind of mysterious fog in between galaxies that did not shift colors, so it didn't give itself away, or if supernovae in the past were born fainter. Well, then you might expect if we could go to even higher redshifts, we would see them look progressively dimmer. Um, however, over the next 10 years, what we found confirmed that the faintening we had seen was actually due to acceleration and dark energy. And the way we knew this is because, well, first of all, we improved the statistics dramatically. Over the next 10 years, lots of surveys from the ground at redshift less than one filled in this Hubble diagram with tremendous statistics so that you could see, even if I bin up the data, it's very clear that the universe is accelerating. But then, we went to such high redshifts, and this was really as a result of the Hubble Space Telescope, we could find supernovae at redshifts much greater than one. And when the universe is much younger and more compact, matter becomes more important. Remember, uh, attractive gravity sort of falls off as one over distance squared. So when you start compressing all the distances, gravity wins. Ordinary attractive gravity wins. And so here we see the universe turn over. That is, it's decelerating before it began accelerating. And this is really the signature we expected once we knew dark energy was out there. The universe is a mixture. It's dark energy and dark matter uh, in a proportion of about 0.3 or 30 percent dark matter, or matter, most of which is dark, and about 70 percent in the form of dark energy. And the kind of dark energy was the thing we really were struggling with trying to understand. So let me say more about that. Why is it really that the universe accelerates? Uh, partly we don't really know, which is what makes it such an interesting research question. But going back to the definition of what makes the universe decelerate or accelerate, that second parameter we talked about, matter plays the first role. Matter can only be positive, and so that can only cause the universe to decelerate the way we define uh, these numbers, deceleration is positive in this case. But other materials can have the opposite effect. This goes back to an idea that Einstein first had. He noticed that 
although the gravity of matter is attractive, the gravity of empty space could be repulsive. Uh, he called this gravity of empty space the cosmological constant. Today, we would call it dark energy. It's some kind of material with some kind of energy density whose physics are a little bit different. In, in particular, this kind of material has a negative pressure. It is kind of an elastic material, and it's the, that elasticity that in Einstein's theory of general relativity causes it to be repulsive. Now, Einstein worked on this for sort of the wrong reason. He thought the attraction and the repulsion would be in perfect balance, keeping the universe static. Uh, later, he learned that the universe was expanding and that that was not necessary. But in our case, we could just see this as this arbitrary kind of repulsive material um, and try to figure out what it is. So uh, the best idea we have comes to us from quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, you expect something called vacuum energy. In fact, uh, it's impossible to empty space of everything, including energy. So we expect a background energy. And in fact, we've seen some background energy. If you've heard of the Higgs field or the Higgs boson, that is an example of dark energy. It's not all the dark energy, but it is an example. This is definitely a feature of quantum mechanics. And so that's what could be going on, except there's a small problem, uh, about 120 orders of magnitude problem, actually, between what the particle physicists calculate this ought to be and what we actually observe. So we're still working on that. Um, but in the meantime, there's a prediction that we should measure the equation of state of dark energy to be exactly minus one. This comes from conservation of energy and is the signature of true vacuum energy. Likewise, we could have a dynamical dark energy. That would mean that it's just a temporary field whose energy is causing the universe to accelerate, but this may change over time. This might sound strange, but there's also a, uh, some pedigree for this as well. This early period in the history of the universe, known as inflation, when we're pretty certain that the universe went through a period of rapid acceleration, that would have decayed away, otherwise we wouldn't be here. And so we think that was a dynamical changing sort of field that produced this. So in this case, we would hope to see that the equation of state, it might be close to minus one, but we would see it changing over time as this field is either growing stronger or weaker at the present time. The third possibility is this is as far as we can go with Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity. This would be the hallmark of it breaking down, that we might be able to see, for example, that as we finally reach the, the scale of the whole universe, that gravity operates differently. So when we use probes of dark energy, like the expansion of the whole universe, those would give us a different answer than on smaller scales, the scales on which clusters form by pulling in new matter. And so we would hope to see a scale dependence. That would be the clue that general relativity is broken and it's time to come up with a new theory of gravity. So the way cosmology is played now, because we have one idea, uh, one model, and then a lot of questions, the way the game is played is we now assume that model called plain lambda CDM, that stands for lambda, assuming it's like this, number one. CDM is that we have cold, dark matter, and plain, I'll get to that in a second. But we assume this, and then we do experiments which probe this in a unique way and we look for departures, departures meaning clues that there's something else going on. So that sets the scene for what you could call the grandest end-to-end -end test of anything, in this case, of the universe, okay? Um, and let me tell you how this end-to-end -end test works. You start out assuming that this new model, this new paradigm we have, lambda CDM, is right. Now, through observations of various phenomena, including the cosmic microwave background, we have an exquisite picture of the composition of the universe. It's about 0.05% uh, planets, half a percent stars, 4% gas. So that's about 4.5% in what we call baryonic material, the same kind of material in the periodic table of elements. Then about 25% of this mysterious dark matter that causes uh, galaxies to spin much faster than you'd think or galaxies to, to whiz around as they orbit each other. And then the dark energy, which I've talked about where we got that idea, about 70% of that. Now, this is our basic model right here. And if we take some naive guesses about the behavior of the dark parts, the parts we don't really understand the physics of, we can get pretty far. So the naive guesses we take about dark matter is we assume it's cold, uh, it's collisionless, 
Uh, it has no interactions. Um, it's stable. It doesn't decay. Uh, in the case of dark energy, we'll assume answer number one, that it is exactly the cosmological constant, that some fine tuning or symmetry we don't yet understand makes it come out to the value that it does, that it's not changing with time. We'll also assume that although the universe looks fairly flat, we'll assume it's exactly flat. Um, and a couple of other details, how many neutrinos are in the universe, we'll assume it's just the three we know from nuclear physics, uh, and a few other details. So we make these assumptions, we can then predict what the size of fluctuations would have been in the radiation left over from the Big Bang. This radiation is called the cosmic microwave background, you probably have heard about this. That is, what we're really calculating is what the sound horizon is, how far sound could propagate uh, before uh, the universe became transparent and the energy was able to radiate out. And that causes these ripples in the cosmic microwave background. We then observe with a satellite like Planck or WMAP the size of those ripples, and that allows us to determine the distance to this point in time a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. And by knowing a distance and a redshift, in this case redshift a thousand, we know how fast the universe was expanding, assuming that this model is right. If this model is right, we have measured how fast the universe was expanding shortly after the Big Bang to a precision of 0.4%. That's actually the best measurement we have ever made of the expansion of the universe. And remarkably, it's at the beginning, not the way it is now. now if we trust this model and our naive assumptions, we can then propagate forward, just like launching that rocket from the surface of the Earth. You measure the rocket when it first launches, and you understand gravity and how heavy the Earth is, and well, people in this room are fantastic at, at this, figuring out how fast that rocket will be much later on, on a different path, a different trajectory. In this case, it's the trajectory the universe followed as it expanded, and this understanding and this initial calibration allows us to predict how fast the universe should be expanding today. That is, it tells us how, what the value of the Hubble constant should be to a precision of about 1%. So this is uh, an ambitious, audacious prediction, and it's one we should test. If we really understand the universe, all these parts, if our assumptions are reasonable and right, we should be able to go out and measure the expansion rate of the universe, and as any experimentalist knows, if you have a prediction that's good to some number, you certainly want to measure it to at least that precision. You don't want to leave on the table a lot of that good uh, predicting power. So that's what we set out to do about 10 years ago. We started a project to try to measure the expansion rate, the Hubble constant, to percent level precision, called the SHOES project. Um, more specifically, if you think the most interesting part of this uh, mystery is dark energy, then by measuring the Hubble constant very well due to the cosmic microwave background information we have, you can measure the equation of state of dark energy, the, that number that tells us which of those three stories is right, to about uh, two percent if you could measure the Hubble constant to one percent. This is much better than it is currently known. So this is uh, also part of the motivation. Okay, so how could we get there to 1% precision? Um, as I'll describe to you, we built a, a simple ladder of measurements, and we tried to pick the best tools, the most reliable ones, and the ones we can link the best. So I'll describe our ladder. It's geometry, Cepheids, and type 1a supernovae. I've talked about these two already a little bit. Um, we would reduce systematic errors by finding ways to take the data in a better way. Again, I'm at a great place where people have put a lot of thought into how to take data in a better way. So maybe you'll see some of those same principles. And then to thoroughly propagate statistical and systematic errors so that we really could have a true error budget at the end. And I'll say more about that in a minute. Okay. So here's a graphical representation of the route we will take to measure the expansion of the universe. It basically has three steps. You could think of it as going from kiloparsecs to megaparsecs to gigaparsecs. Um, and that really means uh, one handover from geometry to Cepheids. Step two is Cepheids to supernovae. And step three is supernovae into the expansion of space. And a very important part of this story, and I'll already start laying some groundwork for Gaia, is we used to not be able to measure parallax out very far at all, only a few hundred parsecs. And there are not, uh, there are not many Cepheids 
in the Milky Way in that small volume. Uh, and so getting out to kiloparsecs is absolutely critical to have a fair number of Cepheids to actually be able to make these kinds of measurements. So I'll say more about that in a minute. Now, I feel like I'm bringing Coles to Newcastle to even talk about parallax here. But I recognize some people in the audience uh, may not work on Gaia. And uh, anyway, there's some, uh, it's always good to think again about parallax, how it is that we measure it. So when I was putting together uh, this talk recently, I wanted to come up with a picture where I could show you to your eye parallax. because. All the parallax data you'll ever see from Gaia, right, it's going to be uh, statistical analysis and computer measurements. It's very difficult to actually see any individual star undergoing parallax. Well, the best chance you have is to pick the very nearest star. In this case, that's Proxima Centauri. And a telescope with outstanding resolution, the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, what you see is now a series of observations taken with Hubble. And notice, relative to the background stars, you will see Proxima Centauri undergoing parallax, uh, actually a combination of two motions. One is a proper motion or drifting motion, you'll see along this direction, and then uh, executing this parallax motion that is a reflection of the Earth's motion around the sun causing this. So here's this uh, little movie as we zip through those stages. And so proper motion is the strongest component, but every time you see the star move perpendicular to that, that is due only to parallax, OK? So it might look easy to make these kinds of measurements. But the challenge is, as I said, this is the very nearest star. It's about a parsec away. We are interested in measuring stars that are thousands of times further away. And this little deflection angle becomes thousands of times smaller completely difficult to see with your eye and requires very careful measurements with various uh, instruments. OK. Um, let's see. OK. Uh, right, this is not. OK. So in, yeah, OK. Um, so in around 2011, uh, we started thinking about, was there any way that we could measure parallax to some of these very distant Cepheids, the ones that are kiloparsecs away? Um, and we came up with an idea that I'm going to tell you about. Um, the rate limiting step, it turns out, for measuring parallax is often just how well you could identify the position of a star and how it changes every six months. Now, for a telescope like the Hubble Space Telescope, when we take a picture, we can locate a star to a precision of about 1 one hundredth of a single pixel. That's pretty good. That's pretty much state of the art. Um, the problem is that's not good enough because one one hundredth of a pixel on the Hubble Space Telescope is about 0.4 milli arc seconds, which means that the error bar is about half the size of the effect. Uh, that is, the parallax you expect for a Cepheid at two kiloparsecs is about twice that. So that's not a very good measurement when your error bar uh, is just good enough to maybe see that that star is far away, but doesn't give you an actually precise measurement. So uh, a few of us had this idea, myself and Stefano Casertano, that perhaps with the Hubble Space Telescope, we could sort of do a little bit of what Gaia was going to do for the whole sky, just at a few pointings in a few specific locations. And so what we, uh, we were aware that uh, the engineers had changed the way we can use Hubble to observe very bright stars without saturating, which people do when they want to look for exoplanets uh, in transits. So we thought, hey, what if we scan the telescope during our observations in the direction perpendicular to the longest axis for parallax? Instead of measuring to 1 one hundredth of a pixel, the separation between two stars, we can measure to that with the error reduced by many samples, many times. It's like collecting thousands of copies of the same picture and getting many chances to measure the separation. You get to reduce the uncertainty. Uh, by doing this. And so this is what we were actually doing then, is taking images. And so while Gaia scans and it moves the charge along, giving you still nice pictures, we are actually getting pictures that are vertical lines. Okay, People would be horrified normally if they got their images and they look like this. But this was exactly what we wanted the telescope to do. So in 2011, we did our first uh, demonstration with some director's discretionary time of a field around Cepheid variable. So here's the field as seen from the ground. 
and as we observed it with the Hubble Space Telescope in 150 arc second scan, and here's a little zoom in. So indeed, we're getting a whole bunch of these vertical lines, uh, which is giving us many opportunities to measure the separation between those lines and to reduce the error. So what we then do is extract these lines row by row, fitting them, and so now what you see all of these lines are actually the scanned lines of those individual stars, except we've lined them up in time. And one of the first things, at first we looked at these and we were a little horrified because uh, they look pretty noisy. We thought that these were gonna be smoother, but of course the telescope has jitter. That is, the telescope bounces along even as it goes in one straight line. Well, that's okay actually, because the jitter affects every single star the same way. We only care about the changing separation between two stars. So we subtract stars, and so what we get is this nice smooth line, which gives us the chance to average down to a precision of about just under one millipixel, one one thousandth of a single pixel, or a statistical error of about 25 micro arc seconds, which is a really small number. Okay. Um, I could take some questions about this. There may be some later on. I want to keep moving through the talk, but I just wanted to mention briefly, um, it's not enough just to get the precision down to 25 micro arc seconds. There are a lot of what we call systematics along the way, things we had to learn and calibrate in the telescope to make use of this. So this shows you in millipixels, uh, this is how well you'd be able to do if you were just taking a normal staring image. The scan image gives you statistics that are much better. The effect we're trying to measure is the parallax at two kiloparsecs. In green are all kinds of sources of things that go on that would distort or cause us to lose some of the information. Things like the intrascan velocity aberration, uh, rotation that occurs during the observations, micro rotations that we have to take out, uh, a breathing, a, a general distortion of the telescope due to thermal fluctuations, uh, another kind of rotation that occurs between frames. Um, but we've been able to, over the last three or four years, get all of these at or below the statistical uncertainty so that we could get meaningful measurements. And so for a handful of stars, we can actually do this. Um, I'm showing you one particular field of stars that we've been observing for four years. Um, every six months, we get an observation. And so what you see here are a whole bunch of stars in the field. We've removed that proper motion, that vector that just showed a star going in one direction. So all you're seeing is the wobble back and forth. The amplitude of that wobble is the parallax. The inverse of that is the distance. And here is one of these Cepheid variables now at a distance of three kiloparsecs. And in a really ideal situation, and this is probably the best example, we can actually get down to something like 30 to 40 micro arc seconds, maybe a little bit better than that in an ideal situation. So this is one source of measuring parallax um, and gives you an idea of what we could get to. Now, we have other ways of measuring the geometric distance to Cepheids besides parallax. I'll say very little about them, but there's a very famous galaxy, NGC 4258, it's about seven megaparsecs away, that has masers, water clouds, in Keplerian motion around the center that can be used to determine geometrically the distance to that galaxy, now to 2.6%. Also, in the Large Magellanic Cloud in the south, there are stars called detached eclipsing binaries, which give you geometric distances. Um, the same can be said for M31. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, in the future, well, we're going to try to measure 20 of these, uh, but later I'm going to get to Gaia, which is going to actually, you know, blow away all of the attempts to do this uh, and make everything fantastic. Um, but let me move along to the second step in our distance ladder. We have to connect Cepheids to supernovae once we've calibrated them. Now, this was the reason the Hubble Space Telescope was built, or one of the main reasons, was to be able to see individual stars in distant galaxies and to be able to calibrate individual stars and whole other galaxies to measure the expansion rate of the universe, or Hubble's constant. Uh, the Hubble constant was uncertain to a factor of two when the Hubble Space Telescope was built. Well, the first really worthwhile camera on Hubble was WIFPIC-2. That was after the correction. Um, and the problem with WIFPIC-2 is it has a pretty limited range. You can only see Cepheid variables with WIFPIC-2 out to a distance of about 20 megaparsecs. And in the 
volume surrounded by a boundary of 20 megaparsecs, there have not been many type 1a supernovae. Only maybe once a decade do you get a supernova. And so that required that people had to go back and calibrate these old photographic plates from the 19th century or from the 1930s. And it's really hard to get a lot of precision out of those old plates. Um, so that was a, a limitation of the time. However, uh, when the astronauts put the advanced camera on a few years later, 10 years later, and then wide field camera three in 2009, that doubled the range, it improved the sensitivity, the pixel scale, and doubled the range that which we could, out to which we could see Cepheids, and twice the range is eight times the volume. So that means there's a good type 1a supernova just about every other year or so. And so we have been able to greatly expand the number of chances or calibrators between Cepheids and supernovae, sticking to really the best observed supernovae, all modern data um, in many past bands with normal spectra, low extinction. And so this has forged a really strong calibration now between supernovae and Cepheids. This took a lot of work with the Hubble Space Telescope. Each of the host galaxies, you have to find and measure Cepheids. And so this shows you all 19 galaxies that are the hosts uh, recently of type 1a supernovae and that we chose to look for Cepheids in those galaxies. And here are, again, pictures of those now. Uh, every blue dot shows you the position of a Cepheid variable that we found in these galaxies. Um, and actually a nice way to see them is for each galaxy we can stack all the light curves of the Cepheid variables in each of these galaxies because any one light curve can look a little ratty, but um, when you stack them all, you see that very characteristic signature of a Cepheid variable where it rises fast and falls slowly, kind of a soft tooth looking light curve. Um, one of the other key aspects of uh, the way we make this measurement and try to reach the high precision we are is by using the same telescope whenever we can to measure the brightness of the Cepheids in the two places we need to measure them. That is in the hosts of supernovae and in the place where they are geometrically calibrated. I'm going to get later to how that will work with Gaia, but I'm just showing you, for example, in the host NGC 4258, which has the, the black hole and the maser, and we know it's distance to 2.6%, if you can observe the Cepheids in both places, concerns like, do you have the right zero points? Are you doing photometry uh, consistently between two telescopes? Those concerns drop out, they cancel out, and that is one of the best ways that we've been able to reduce systematic errors in our measurements. Also by matching the kinds of Cepheids we observe in these galaxies. I could say more about that. Another way we have reduced the systematic errors over past measurements of Cepheids is by moving to longer wavelengths. We now make all of our observations of Cepheids in the near infrared, in the H band. Um, the advantage here is you can see through dust. Uh, dust is a factor of five or six times uh, weaker or less absorption than in the visual where these measurements are usually made. Here's a nice example in M31, the Andromeda galaxy. This is the famous galaxy where Edwin Hubble saw the first Cepheid variable that showed, aha, the Andromeda is outside the Milky Way and well, we uh, have lots of uh, other galaxies out there. Well, we found that taking the uh, Cepheids observed from the ground, we could follow them up with uh, the Hubble Space Telescope in the near infrared and get much sharper period luminosity relations for these because we could see through all of that dust. Okay, so here are the period luminosity relations now for each of these 19 galaxies. Here they are for the four anchors. We can use up to four anchors, NGC 4255, um, parallaxes to Milky Way stars. Most of these are nearby. They were done a decade earlier by Fritz Benedict using the fine guidance sensor. Um, the Large Magellanic Cloud and M31. Um, and here's the third step. The third step is using supernovae to measure the expansion rate of the universe once you've calibrated them. And so here is the Hubble diagram today of supernovae nearby. Here is uh, distance and here is redshift. And uh, we have fit a slightly more complex than the normal Hubble law because we need to account for the fact that the expansion rate of the universe is changing. That is, we have to use the right value of Q naught, even, even J naught, which is the next term in the succession of kinematic terms. Those are fit mostly from higher redshift supernovae. All we need to get from this step is what is the intercept of the Hubble diagram? How fast is the universe expanding? So you combine all these, and I just want to show you one step. Um, 
this combination is done simultaneously. All of these parts, the measurements of Cepheids and supernova hosts, or in these anchor galaxies of the supernovae themselves, or geometric distance priors, by which I mean if you had parallax measurements or you knew the distance to a galaxy, these are all done simultaneously so that we can keep track of the covariance of all the uncertainties so that we don't lose that. In the old days when people would measure the Hubble constant, they would just do a series of graphs and fit a line and carry that forward, but they would lose the information about covariance. So we have kept track of the covariance, but the final result is that you're essentially determining what is the true luminosity of a supernova and what is the intercept of the supernova Hubble diagram. Um, so this, these three steps that I showed you before, um, now they'll be much more convincing because we've made a movie out of them. So. This is kind of cool. So th this is essentially what this measurement is. You're measuring parallax or some equivalent of that geometrically nearby. You're looking for Cepheids blinking in galaxies that host supernovae. And then far away, you have supernovae that are so far out, their light is getting redshifted by the time we receive it with our telescope. So you can think of all these three, three things are going on at once. We've lashed them together with measurements so that we can calibrate the true expansion rate of the universe. The, the real representation of that is in this one single plot here, which you could call the distance ladder. This is one single line that connects distances you know, to the nearest star or so all the way out to gigaparsecs. Um, and so these are the three steps that I talked about. Here on this axis, it's geometry, which is calibrating Cepheids. So that can be Milky Way parallaxes. You see a bunch of them here. It could be the LMC M31 or NGC 4258. Um, then there's these 19 galaxies that have both supernovae and Cepheids. So they're sort of like Rosetta Stones, if you will. They, they speak both languages. Um, and so once geometry has calibrated the Cepheids, they move to the x-axis here because they're known. They calibrate the y-axis. And then the last step is the expansion of the universe. Supernovae now calibrated against redshift to determine that the expansion rate of the universe is 73.24 plus or minus 1.74. So that's a 2.4% uncertainty. Um, considering all sources of error, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, now, we can use different anchors, different sources of the geometric information, and I'm showing you some of those individually. Our preferred result is to use the combination of NGC 4258, this handful of Milky Way parallaxes, uh, and the large Magellanic Cloud, but we get similar answers with various anchors. Uh, I will point out that the Milky Way parallaxes currently are a little high uh, relative to the other values. That'll be interesting coming up a little later in the talk when we start to look at Gaia. Um, and I just wanted to point out other teams have taken our data now and reanalyzed it using other frameworks. The most recent one is the Swiss group, Cardona, Kunz, and Pedarini. Um, who get 73.75 using a hyperparameter analysis. Don't ask me too much about hyperparameters, but it's a very complex Bayesian operation that adds a, a partial weight parameter to every single observation. When they don't do that, they get a, uh, an uncertainty that's even smaller than ours. Okay, we consider systematics. We consider 23 variants of ways that you might have analyzed the data, changing reddening laws and metallicity and different supernova fitters, different ranges of redshift. You consider the Hubble flow, different types of host galaxies that you might be limit your analysis to, the possibility that there's a break in the period luminosity relationship, different period ranges that you might trust more than others, uh, how you might remove any outliers. And so this is the distribution of values we get all in the sort of low to mid 70s. And the breadth of this is added as a systematic error to the previous statistical errors from the full analysis. So we've been at this for a number of years. This would be our uh, DR3, if you uh, get my drift. And uh, so at, this was the old uncertainty from the Hubble Key Project. They got the uncertainty down to 10%, which was you know, very good. That was using WIFPIC2. Uh, we got the uncertainty in our DR1 down to about 5% then 3%, now we're at about 2.5%. Uh, we're hoping to move ahead, as I'll talk about, to a kind of DR4 or maybe 5. Here's a breakdown of the various sources of uncertainty. Um, I'll just point out that the two largest terms are the anchor distance, that is the geometric 
scale. How, this is the kind of thing that Gaia would be able to dramatically improve. And I'll say more about that. That is actually the biggest term that is left. It's also uh, the number of these Rosetta Stone galaxies. We have 19. We would like to add more. Um, and I'll say more about that. But let's take a break now and do the end-to-end -end test and see how well are we doing. Did we match uh, what, the, uh, what our powerful model of the universe would tell us? Well, not quite. Um, here is our measurement. It's at about 73 plus or minus 1.8. Here's uh, the Planck team 2015 uh, measurement plus lambda CDM, plus the model of the universe. So they get even smaller uncertainties, as I said. They're at about 67 plus or minus 0.6. So formally, there's about a 3.4 sigma tension between these. These do not quite agree. Now, if you take the best me measurements of the Hubble constant that do not involve type 1a supernovae, uh, but have been done locally, they're the ones shown in green here. Th th these came from the Planck team's list of what they thought the best other measurements were. So here's the average of those, also is more consistent with where we are. Now, since we published this, there's a team, the Holy Cow team, that has been using strong lensing systems um, this is the Roger Blanford and Sherry Suyu, Tommaso Treo, Chris Fosnock. They're very impressive team, very impressive work. Um, they, their current measurement is about here, also uh, a few sigma away from the Planck observation. So this is an interesting situation. Uh, we can say for sure that one of three things is going on. Either there's something wrong with our measurement, there's something wrong with the Planck measurement, or there's some interesting physics going on. Um, I can at least, I'm going to address both, uh, well, all three of those a little bit. I do want to say, though, as I said, this is our DR3. This is their DR3, I think. Um, so these are fairly mature measurements. This is not, you know, the first time these groups have, you know, popped out of the, the rabbit hole they've been working in and uh, said, oh, this is what we get. I mean, the, there's been a great deal of thought, effort, and analysis that has gone into this, okay? Um, so what could the new physics be? Well, this is all potentially exciting stuff. So dark energy could do this. What I've shown here are a bunch of different possibilities, non-plain, non-vanilla changes to lambda CDM, where the length of the arrow represents what is allowed by other data sets, uh, values or changes that are not ruled out currently, and how big a shift they would cause in the inferred value of the Hubble constant from the cosmic microwave background. So the top one here is if dark energy is stronger than we think. If dark energy is stronger than we think, it makes the universe accelerate even faster. That's why the universe would be expanding faster today. Alternatively, dark energy is getting stronger. That is, it is evolving to be stronger over time. And uh, both of those could do something like this. Another possibility is if there is another neutrino or relativistic particle in the early universe. Now, when you have one of those, you can have just a fraction of it appear because it depends when it decouples in temperature and time even uh, before the cosmic microwave background comes out. What that does is it changes your calculation of how much energy is in radiation, matter, and it changes your calculation of the sound horizon. So it throws off the calibration of the cosmic microwave background. A little bit of curvature of space could solve some of this, not a lot of it. You could get away with about 0.01 from other data. That wouldn't quite get you all the way there. Uh, another idea, uh, I learned these when I go to conferences. Uh, somebody recently pointed out a model where if dark matter and radiation had any interaction in the early universe when things were very dense, it would act very much like this change in the relative proportions of energy, and it would change the calibration of the cosmic microwave background. So you need a cross section of 10 to the minus 33, which is not ruled out in any other way. Um, so those are all potentially exciting possibilities. Uh, a, a word of caution, though, potentially comes from uh, WMAP, the, the satellite that came before Planck. Their final uh, effort, their DR5, I would say, with the ground-based experiments, SPT and ACT, and baryon acoustic oscillations, was sort of in between. Um, now, these are both CMB measurements, so any disagreement between those makes you wonder a little bit if there could be any issue with the cosmic microwave background. But let me, let me talk about our issues first and what we could be doing wrong. Here is back our, the measurement I showed you. To get our value 
to agree with the Planck value, well, you'd have to shift us by about two tenths of a magnitude, or 20% uh, of brightness. That's a lot. Um, we've been talking at this meeting about measuring millimags, and so you know, two tenths of a magnitude is a lot. But it would show up on one of these three plots, like this red dotted line would be actually where the data should be sitting. And as you can see, you know, none of the data really looks like that at all. Um, here, because there's so many objects, you, uh, by just the broadening, the, by being able to see the width of the distribution of the bell curve, you do get points down there, but the vast majority of them are up there. So that's a difficult way. It, it, it's, a, it's a big jump for us. It's so far away from the, the scale at which we think we've calibrated things. Another possibility that people often wonder about is, could it be that locally, in this little bubble we live, the universe is expanding faster, but that's not typical for most of the universe. Maybe the universe is kind of chunky and choppy, and so we're in a pocket of big expansion. Well, we have the ability to test that using type 1a supernovae because our Hubble diagram, our measure of the expansion rate of the universe, goes all the way out to redshift of 2. So it's not really such a local measurement. So we use the terms Q0 and J0 to account for changes in the expansion rate. And then after that, we can look as we go further out or as we increase the volume from 1 cubic uh, gigaparsec to 10 cubic gigaparsecs, how H0 changes, how, what the relative fluctuations are. And as you can see, they're well described by variations of about half a percent, okay? So if we disagreed by half a percent with Planck, you know, this could absolutely be the explanation. The problem is we disagree by 9% with Planck. And so this is tiny. They need to be, we need to be down here at 0.91. And so the scale of these fluctuations is much too small. And in fact, n-body simulations recently done by uh, Odorskov show that the, in fact, you expect fluctuations of size of about 0.3% as you move the observer around in location. So we see fluctuations that are small. We expect fluctuations that are small. Uh, this does not seem to be uh, a fruitful source to look for the size of changes that we expect. OK, let me get back to Planck. Um, there has been a suggestion raised or an interesting paper raised that perhaps there's some internal inconsistency within Planck that may be interesting or may shed some light on this. When you look at the whole power spectrum that Planck observes of the cosmic microwave background, um, you could divide it in essentially half and compare the results you get from one side to the other side. People at the workshop today were doing this quite a lot with Gaia data, comparing one half to the other to explore systematics. Well, in this case, this lower L half is the part that WMAP has observed. This higher L half, they have not observed. Uh, it turns out the lower L half actually would alone give a Hubble constant, which is much higher, about 70. Uh, the higher L half alone would give a Hubble constant much lower, around 64. The answer they're getting is right in the middle because, of course, they're using the whole thing. Um, so this has been pointed out by Addison and others of some sign of internal inconsistency, that they actually suspect that there's something wrong with the high L half. This was their final analysis where they showed the value of the Hubble constant and the mass density and how five out of six things agreed, and the one thing that was sort of the odd thing out was the high L half of Planck, that you could sort of have a, a concordance value of about 70 and a half omega matter 0.28, and that would be make everything happy except for high L. Now, the Planck team a couple months ago put out a paper analyzing this. Here again is their two halves. Uh, they did it as a function of where you make the divide. So matching Addison, the divide here, it's this half versus this half over here. And they also get that this is formally about two and a half sigma different. Um, now, their statement is it looks like two and a half sigma to you because you're only focused on this one parameter, but there's really six parameters that describe the cosmic microwave background. And finding one of those to be out of bed like this at two and a half sigma is sort of like a 1.8 sigma result when you really consider that there are six parameters. Our, my response to that has been, I can't measure any of those other parameters. This is the one we've been focused on, the Hubble constant, because we can actually check it. So I think we probably should be focused on just that one parameter. Anyway, this story will continue to evolve. We think the best thing we can do now is to improve the local measurement. And we think Gaia is definitely the ticket to do that. In fact, even DR1 gave us a very powerful test 
of the Hubble constant measurement today, a test that it could have failed. Um, when DR1 came out and two days had elapsed, Stefano Casertano, myself, and two of our collaborators in Italy um, were able to quickly take the 200-some Cepheid parallaxes in Milky Way parallaxes that DR1 measured to a mean precision of about 0.3 milliard seconds. And we played the game of take our value of the Hubble constant and the Cepheid period luminosity relationship that we got from our analysis and predict the Gaia parallaxes. So here on this axis is our prediction of the Gaia parallaxes. On this axis is the actual measurement of the Gaia parallaxes. You'll notice that they agree pretty well. Uh, in fact, actually, they agree too well. The, well. One of the things we talked a lot about at the conference is whether uh, the f current round of Gaia uh, error bars actually are, are too conservative, that they actually overestimate the uncertainties. We get that they probably overestimate them by about a factor of 20%. So now we can make two interesting comparisons. We could play the game two different ways. One is we could say, let's use this comparison to test Gaia and see if Gaia is getting the right zero point, if there's an error there. So in that case, we add a, a possible shift to all Gaia parallaxes until they best match the predicted Cepheid parallaxes. That's this curve shown here. The amount of shift we get is vanishing. It's one micro arc second, plus or minus 19 micro arc seconds. That is, we cannot detect any problem at all with the Gaia parallaxes. So then we play the other game. Let's pretend Gaia is right. Um, let's change the value of the Hubble constant until we get the best agreement. That's here on the left. And so we rescale all the parallaxes. And as you see, the rescaling is very close to one. That is, we get a Hubble constant of 73.2. If we replace the first step of the distance ladder with Gaia, we get about 73.0. The Planck value of 66.9 would sit up here. This is delta chi-square. So this tells us how, how well that's ruled out. If we use the errors as Gaia published them, that would be about 2 and a half sigma off. If we rescale the errors, which we think is the appropriate thing to do because we think they're overestimated, at least for the Cepheids, then we'd be over 3 sigma off. So this is interesting. It's another indication of this tension. Um, and if I had worried about any step in our analysis, it would be this first rung. This is the hardest part. Um, so this is, I think, a little bit of a taste of what Gaia can do. Um, again, this is only DR1. So let's look uh, ahead a little bit in time. This is some 200 Cepheids in the Milky Way. The truth is only about 60 of these Cepheids are really the best ones, the ones that have very long periods, because those are the only kind you can see in distant galaxies that host supernovae. So we could cut the sample down to about the 60 best. OK? And uh, imagine improvements that will be made in these over the next few years. Now, I told you we're measuring our own parallaxes for a small number of these, not many of them. And I just show you the progress we made as of maybe the last month or so. This is seven parallaxes that have precisions of about 30 to 40 micro arc seconds uh, by the technique that I talked about with the spatial scanning of HST. Um, but that's never going to get all of them. It's never going to get most of them. And even our best measurements will still be a factor of four worse than Gaia's ultimate measurements. So this is like a stopgap, something we can do as an independent check. But really, Gaia's final results will be the thing that really allows us to measure the Hubble constant well. Let me tell you exactly how that will work. So here are the two steps of the distance ladder where Gaia will be relevant. Um, here is that uh, initial calibration where we use Milky Way parallaxes. Now, Gaia, by 2022, should be able to take these 60 best Milky Way Cepheids, the ones that have long periods and low extinction, and measure 10 or better micro arc second parallaxes. That'll go on to this axis. That means you are measuring the distance to each Cepheid to about 3%. Some of that comes because of uh, internal scatter of Cepheids themselves. That 3% over square root of 60, if you make 60 measurements, means that Gaia's anchoring of the Hubble constant, its, it's sort of first step, will only incur error of 0.4%. 
you know, our goal is to get to 1%. You can't get to 1% unless the pieces that, that go into that are much smaller than 1%. So that would certainly be the case here. Um, one challenge, though, is we then have to link up to these Cepheids that Gaia observes to the Cepheids in distant galaxies that host supernovae. Those are observed with the Hubble Space Telescope with a different set of filters. It's crucial that we observe these Cepheids with that same set of filters. Otherwise, just having to transform from one to another would incur about a 1.5% uncertainty in the Hubble constant. That would totally blow the budget. Um, so what we've been doing, uh, anticipating Gaia's final results, is we've taken these 60 Cepheids, and we've also just been observing their photometry on the HST system. And we do this also with spatial scanning, but with a much faster spatial scanning. We go into gyro control, and under gyro control, we could scan at 7.5 arc seconds per second. That means it's an effective exposure time of 0.01 seconds. Why do we want such a expo short exposure time? Because these are really bright stars. These stars are like fifth and sixth magnitude. Some of these you could almost see with your naked eye at night. And the Hubble Space Telescope has a big mirror, so we wouldn't want to saturate. So we have to scan very fast to avoid saturation. But we've been doing that, observing at a number of known epochs, so that we can get the photometry, the other axis in this, on the same system as HST. So there should be no uncertainty added here. Gaia at 0.4% here, and that would be the anchor to measuring the Hubble constant to 1%. So looking ahead, here's where we were at our uh, DR2. Here's where we hope to be in our DR4, maybe by next year, with the parallaxes we're observing with the Hubble Space Telescope. But looking ahead to when Gaia is done, um, we hope to have these 60 galactic Cepheids with uh, 10 micro arc second parallaxes and their HST photometry. We hope by then we've gone from 19 to 50 of these supernova hosts. Um, and so these are the individual pieces which added together in quadrature would get you to 1%. A 1% measurement of the Hubble constant, first of all, the tension I talked about before, it would make that situation much more obvious what's going on because you know we our error bar is the rate limiting error bar. It would make our error bar the size of Planck's error bar and if at the same time, we would be replacing all the data. And so we might learn about a systematic error along the way. But um, even if we don't, combined with CMB stage four, which is the next successor to Planck in cosmic microwave background, uh, this will be done from the ground, I believe, uh, in Chile, um, will lead to the ability to measure the equation of state of dark energy to 2%, the derivative of dark energy to about 20%, the curvature of space to two parts in a thousand, or the number of relativistic particles in the early universe to a precision of less than a tenth. That will really tell you uh, what is going on. If, if there is another piece, but it's less than, a, uh, less than one, measuring it this finely will tell you when in the history of the universe it decoupled, which tells, which tells particle physics, physicists a lot about the nature of the particle. So this span from measuring parallaxes with Gaia to understanding the early universe, it's quite a span, but uh, I think that uh, these are the kinds of measurements we can look forward to in the near future. So I'll end there and take any questions that you have. Thank you very much. A uh, really interesting talk. Okay, yeah, first question. So thanks for the talk. There, I have two quick questions. One, I, I was surprised that you said that the, the time of the CMB is redshift 1000. Yeah. How come if redshift is just actual, you know, displacement of the lines, how come the time when it became optically detectable had exactly redshift 1000? Can you? Yeah, because that? that corresponds to the time when uh, the universe has a uh, temperature at that time of about 3,000 degrees. And so that's uh, the time at which electrons and protons combine and form hydrogen, and it, the universe becomes transparent. Before that point, you have electrons and protons are separate because 3,000 degrees is hot enough to ionize hydrogen. So they can't combine. And when the electrons are separate, you get lots of Thompson scattering off electrons. Photons 
can't travel anywhere without crashing into something. So we can never see really the universe before that happens. And it happens at a redshift of 1,000 because that's how you go from 3,000 degrees at that time to today the universe is 3 degrees from that radiation. That factor of 1,000 is exactly uh, 3 degrees today to how, so at what redshift do you change 3 degrees to 3,000 at 1,000? Second question is, you mentioned this uh, technical enhancement for HST to be able to do this scan with going down to a few tens of right. micro arc seconds. There's a technological you know, advancement that you, had, you needed in Hubble to be able to measure your, your distances. Uh, how, what, how much, like looking uh, in hindsight, what fraction of the full, like the full cosmic ladder study was possible thanks to that technical achievement? And you know what right. kind of lessons would you take out of that from right. future for future missions? So, so we've we've made very little use of that so far because it's taken us many years to understand the systematics involved in that. And of course, we have to separate proper motion from parallax. Just like Gaia has to run from 2013 to 2022, you know, we need three or four years of data in order to make use of that. We only had the idea about five years ago. So. Almost none. I think there's two parallax measurements, um, if I could go back a second, um, of all those measurements. Ah, yeah, uh, well, I'll just go back a little further to the actual one. Here. Um, so there's only two points in here, these two right here, that we me measured with the Hubble Space Telescope using this spatial scanning technique. Um, everything else. Uh, came from either the fine guidance sensor, which is a, an interferometer, a white light uh, measure, um, or these geometric distances to these other galaxies. But Gaia is the thing that's going to just fill this area with tiny error bars. Uh, well, I also got two. One, uh, the um, precision of measurements of Cepheids and a supernova 1A in a single galaxy. Uh, I'm wondering how precise are we now? Does the size of the host galaxy already matter? Um, the size of the host galaxy matters in terms of how many Cepheids we're likely to find. So we don't like to target a dwarf galaxy just because we won't have many Cepheids. It takes about 25 to 30 Cepheids to beat the precision of the supernova distance, which is something you want to do. You want to be limited by the supernova distance because that's the best you can do. So we generally avoid small galaxies. There's a small difference in the luminosity of supernovae in large and small galaxies, which is accounted for in the analysis. This was discovered a number of years ago. It seemed to be a small mass dependence. It's a couple hundredths of a magnitude. Um, those are the only ways in which uh, the galaxy matters. Of course, it needs to be the kind of galaxy which will host Cepheids, which means it has to be a star-forming galaxy. So elliptical galaxies need not apply. Uh, that already links into the second question. The supernova 1A, I mean, if you measure one at very high um, Z, um, I mean, you have a different chemical environment uh, and uh, metallicity. Uh, and I mean, it's also the progenitors are not known. So we don't know whether it really right. is a, a, a main sequence companion or a binary um, merger. Sure. Um, so is, are, the, are these uncertainties really under control? Right. Uh, for, right. To, you know, that they right. don't propagate into that's your a, that, That's a great question. One of the advantages of type 1A supernovae is that we see them in sort of the full range of galaxy ages and environments locally. So type 1A supernovae, unlike the Cepheids, we do see in star-forming galaxies and in elliptical galaxies. We see them in old red dead galaxies that have not had evolution in a long time and the ones that are currently evolving. And so we've been able to develop our calibrations to measure them equally well. And the change in galaxies to the red shifts we're looking at is much smaller than just the, the the variation that you see locally. So in a way, we've been able to calibrate this out. In another way, we have also seen a bit of demographic shift. As we go to higher redshift, we see a slightly different mix of the supernovae. The ones with very broad light curves that are more luminous are more common in young galaxies, and we see more of those at high redshift. So the distribution does change. We had, we have not seen any evidence for true evolution, where the supernova doesn't behave like any analog we have seen nearby. Okay. 
So in the early plots, you show that type 1A is going out to about a redshift of 1.3. And so how important would it be to, say, pick up more of those at, at a redshift beyond that? Um, let's see. Yeah, here. So we've gone out, actually, this tick right here is redshift 2. Oh, and oh, okay. with, with HST, we have gone out to redshift 2. With JWST, we should be able to go out to redshift 3. But what we find when we go out there is that they're very uh, rare. It seems that it takes a star, as you imagine, a while to become a white dwarf and then accrete material and explode. So we believe, although our statistics are not great on this, that the, the rate is rapidly dropping across there. So I doubt we will actually be able to find them at redshifts higher than about two and a half or three. They also, believe it or not, become less useful for cosmology because uh, dark, the action of dark energy is actually at lower redshifts. And so if you're interested in dark energy, you want to measure them really well here. If you want to learn more about omega matter, the mass density, then you would go to higher redshift. But that is already done much better by other techniques like baryon acoustic oscillations. Sure. Yeah, one of the other things Guy was going to do was to provide calibrations for the nearby supernovae because it would be discovering you know, a large number of them. Have you considered what improvements might be available from those better calibrations? Sure. So Gaia can also be sort of a, a supernova search engine, finding thousands of supernovae. And then ground-based telescopes need to follow them because the complement of filters and the time sampling that you need for supernovae will be quite different than what Gaia would naturally find. Nevertheless, finding them is a tremendous uh, help because they're, you know, it's a needle in a haystack problem. Um, so I imagine as Gaia starts regularly announcing these type 1A supernovae, ground-based observers will follow them up and they will end up going into the growing the sample, especially at this, this low redshift then. You could almost never have enough down here. We have hundreds, but as I recall, Gaia could find up to 6,000. So that would be a big improvement. Yeah. And then your scanning technique was very clever. Um, could you describe how you did the correction from relative to absolute? Sure. Um, that is that. So when you make parallax measurements from space, so the way Guy and Hipparchus did, and the way people typically do it from the ground is dramatically different. The, the large angle method is you break the degeneracy with parallax by looking at uh, two lines of sight that have different parallax phase, and that's, that's a great way to do it. Um, when you only have a narrow field of view, then you have to produce references in your field, and so that usually means uh, quasars or stars of large distance. And so we have a very extensive program of measuring stars in these fields. Uh, we take high resolution spectroscopy. We follow them with uh, 12 or 14 bands. Uh, we use all of HST's Stromgren bands, which are used to separate uh, metallicity and temperature. We observe them in the ultraviolet. Um, and we uh, observe them in the infrared, and then we also use WISE observations. And so I have a couple backups I could show you. Um, if I get there, oops, excuse me. My staff from relative to absolute, well, that's going to help. Um, OK, first, let me just show you uh, how we do the monitoring. Yeah, this is good. So this was from our paper, Stefano's paper on SSCMA. So this is one typical star. So we get high resolution spectrum of it fit the spectral type, then we get 12 bands, including all of these Stromgren bands, and that is used to simultaneously determine the extinction, the law of gravity, and the temperature, and then we determine the distance. We do it for all the stars along the line of sight, which actually also allows us to map extinction as a function of distance, and at the end we get an estimate of distance, and if we say conservatively that's good to about three-tenths of a magnitude, then you ask, what kind of astrometric reference does that give you? So here's a Monte Carlo of a 1,000 random fields, uh, the number of stars that we can observe in one. And so on average, it depends on the particular distances of the stars. But uh, we would expect to be able to have astrometric reference that's good to about 10 micro arc seconds. And yet we're trying to measure to 30 or 40 micro arc seconds. So, so far in the observations we've done, it's been subdominant.
Okay, I, ha I have one question. If we have a supernova explosion tomorrow in our own galaxy, awesome. how, how will this improve things on the systematics? Or? If a supernova went off in our galaxy, uh, it would be fantastic if Gaia could observe its parallax. Now, it would be very bright, <laughs> depending on where it went off, but it might be doable, uh, depending on where it went off. And also, you can wait till it fades a little bit, you know, in a couple of months. It'll fade, you know, four or five magnitudes. So they would measure the parallax. Now, that would, you would think in a way that would cut out a step, you know, like who needs the Cepheids and all the uncertainty with that. We just go parallax, supernovae, we're done. Shouldn't the measurements be better? The problem is every individual supernova has a kind of uncertainty, you know, the, as well as we could calibrate them, each of them is only good to about 6% in distance. So you'd have one calibrator that's good to 6%, but we want to get the Hubble constant to 1%. So you immediately see that, yeah, you've cut out the Cepheid step, but you've also lost or reduced your sample of calibrators from 19 or our goal of 50 just down to one. So what you give up is much more than what you're getting. Um, it would still be cool if one went off, but, and we'd still measure it and add it, but, you know, it would not, you know, what you really need is 50 supernovae to go off in the Milky Way, um, and you know, there would be something wrong if that happens. <laughs> Get a five-year extension. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have a quick question also. Uh, what's your feeling that uh, how the discrepancy of the different options will, will be resolved between the uh, C and B? Oh, the, the different kind of physics? Yeah, what will happen so, at the end? So I'll tell you, if you take the path of least resistance, which is to say, you know, pick the thing that doesn't violate anything else, and then, you, you know, you talk to theoretical physicists and go, how bad would it be if this happened or this happened? Then you're led to the one that's labeled dark radiation. That is another particle in the early universe. And the reason is because dark energy will actually change the way, if you change dark energy, you actually change the expansion history in recent times. And that's been mapped well enough with supernovae and baryon acoustic oscillations. Now, it doesn't look different than lambda. I, I still give you some room with those arrows. It could be a little different. But it, it's also very confounding to understand how that would happen. Whereas uh, particle physicists tell me it's no problem adding particles, uh, adding <laughs> neutrinos, things that they call sterile neutrinos with, uh, with only um, gravitational interactions. They could, the ones I know can make 10 of those before breakfast. So um, it, that is not a problem. In fact, they look, they go, actually, this is the right way to figure out if there are sterile neutrinos, is compare the Hubble constant uh, locally to the CMB. So that way seems a pretty easy way out. Um, you know, it wouldn't be crazy. Nobody would go, it violates some symmetry or anything like that. Um, so, but you know, it, it, that's an extraordinary claim that you discovered a particle by making cosmological measurements of the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, and so, you know, you really want to get this right and be sure. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there is another question. Yeah, a similar, a similar question. So um, what do you think the simplest explanation is for the 120 orders of magnitude problem, because if we are going to say that it's lambda, a lambda C, right. then, then uh, what is the solution there? Right. So the the people, the smartest people I know, who are much smarter than me and think deeply about this, have gone in the direction of what's called the multiverse or the landscape, where they imagine that you know string theory has some predictive power, and that predictive power is to show that. There are so many ways of building the universe and the fundamental constants by setting different string frequencies and forms. You get 10 to the 500 different ways you can make the universe. All of them happen. All of them get a sort of random throw of the dice in terms of how bad that 10 to the 120 orders of magnitude problem is. And when you throw dice 10 to the 500 times, you get coincidences at the 10 to the 120 level all the time. And then those are the universes that people can form because, of course, if the cosmological constant is, you know, an order of magnitude, or let alone 120 orders of magnitude stronger, you don't uh, allow, attract gravity enough time to form galaxies and planets and us. So those are the, the, so the anthropic principle is what tells you why we're here wondering about this mystery. Now, I don't like this at all uh, because um, it's not really science. I mean, there's no prediction that's coming out of that. And so I think it would lead to the decoupling of science and, uh, you know, cosmology. And uh, I, when I said that there are, uh, you need extraordinary evidence to 
believe about a particle in the universe, I think you would need much more extraordinary evidence for something like that. And I don't know how they would get that evidence. Um, so until there, that becomes testable, I think it's just sort of a nice, nice tail. OK. Oh. Um, hi. Great talk. Um, so of all of those different options that would make the Planck results agree with your results, does it have to be just one of them, or do you think it could no. be some combination no. of them? No, I mean, you know, what most, uh, you know, you ask most scientists, they, you know, their gut feeling is to follow Occam's razor and, you know, say, oh, it's much simpler to have one explanation than to have multiples. <laughs> but, you know, multiple things have happened before. Okay. There's another okay. question. Yeah. So, so in the plot, what you were showing the tension between the Planck Hubble constant value and the the one measured by combining WMAP with ACT, SPT, and a few other things, that yeah. uh, still has some tension. Since the the measure the, this combination of uh, WMAP with the high resolution SPT and ACT that also that are really observing the very high L modes. Yes. So. So since the Edison paper is, is shooting at the high L modes from Planck, the fact that the, this combination of WMAP and high L from SPT and SCT is, not, is somewhere in the middle, doesn't this give you an idea that maybe we should be looking for more other, other places for this tension, other, just, other than just the Planck high Ls? Well, I mean, at face value, I think it actually could point the finger at uh, the high ohm modes of Planck because what you're saying is when we replace the high L data that WMAP doesn't have from the ground with SPT, then the tension is reduced or, you know, as, as Graham had in his paper. And again, I'm not saying this is the right answer. I'm just, I'm just presenting the different options here. But when, when you look at, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I just noticed that. When you look at those, Right, SPT and the high L part of Planck go in different directions. Here it is, right? So SPT is in orange here. So that's the high L part of the CMB as they observe it, whereas in blue is how Planck observes it. So presumably the high L part of the CMB has only one thing to, there's only one right answer here. So if they're observed in different ways, there could be a systematic error potentially in the measurements, and so this paper is arguing, well, the, the SPT high L looks okay, so it makes it look like the Planck high L. But, you know, again, these things are all at the couple of sigma level. This is not, you know, strong enough to say, aha, we know what's going on. Do you know where the ACT data if, if AC, ACT, uh, ACT is not on this plot. ACT actually adds very little. ACT is much weaker uh, in terms of number of modes than SPT. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, one last question. Is there any chance that DAO observations will get better? Oh, they will get much better. There's okay. no question. The one challenge with BAO is this is really something between the CMB and the Hubble constant because the CMB gives you an absolute scale. You, you, you take fundamental physics and you calculate the size of a feature in the universe, the sound horizon. It's, it's, the, it's an echo. And then you observe that echo and that gives you a distance and that's absolute. Um, likewise, with the Hubble constant, you start out with parallax and you try not to screw it up as you move further out, but it, that's an absolute scale. These are the two only absolute scales we have. BAO measures relative because it measures how that CMB setup feature looks, is reflected in the survey of galaxies, in the distribution of galaxies around us. But if you go and you change the cosmic microwave background calibration, you add another particle in the early universe, you change the calculation of the sound horizon, all of BAO shifts along with that. So it's, so it's it, this, this, can we get the scale right, these bookends of the universe is really about, you know, going from parallax to uh, first principles of, of uh, the, the, kinematics of sound in the early universe. Okay, thank you very much again, first time the speaker.